Welcome aboard the virtual ship with Fellowship Chicago. While we can't have church traditionally, we can still be the church consistently. New method, same message. New platform, same power. New season, same God. Now, let's go into our worship experience. What's happening, family? Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to our Wednesday night refuel. Listen, it is a good day. I mean, it is a great day, a fantastic day. Why is that so? We are still alive. And for that reason, you ought to rejoice. You ought to give God praise and be thankful unto the Lord. For he has blessed us to see yet another day. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Our pastor is still on sabbatical. And while he's on sabbatical, we are playing throwbacks. And listen, y'all, today we're going all the way back to October 13th, 2019, when our pastor preached. I got a lot going on. And listen, many of us got a lot going on. And I encourage you, family, to tune into this message. But before we get into that message, I want to give you an opportunity to worship through giving. Seven ways to give are popping up on the screen right now. And we encourage you, family, to sow in. That's what Pastor asked us to do. He asked us to show up. He asked us to sow in. And God will sow up. And so I encourage you, family, to sow in tonight. We don't offer any gimmicks here at Fellowship. Just trust God and that God will give unto you if you give to God. Listen, family, let's get into this exciting word and I'll come back at the end of the message. Peace. Come with me to the third Psalm, the third Psalm, the third Psalm, the third Psalm. And when you find it, when you find it, I just want to invite you to stand in honor of God's word if you're able to stand. The third Psalm, the third Psalm, the third Psalm. Mm. Mm, I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The third Psalm, and I want to read verses 1 and 2, and then I want to call your attention to verse 6. I'm reading out of the King James Version, Psalm 3, verses 1 and 2, and I promise to be finished preaching about 11.45. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The third Psalm, verse 1 and 2, and then verse 6, reads like this. David says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many, somebody say many. Many, many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Come down to verse 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about verse one again lord how are they increased they trouble me many are they that rise up against me many there be which say of my soul there's no help for him in god i want to talk today from this thought very simply i've got a lot going on i've got a lot thank you you may be seated i hope you like who you sat by if you don't like them that's your fault because you sat down beside them or they sat down beside you but look at that neighbor and said neighbor I got to keep it 100. I've got a lot going on. I've got a lot going on. That's the wrong neighbor. They're trying to be bougie and act like they don't know you. So turn around and find somebody else around you and say, neighbor, I'm for real, for real. I'm for real, for real. I've got a lot going on. I'm a, I've got a lot going on. My brothers and sisters, I want to preface this message by sharing that the Psalms, the book of Psalms is the largest book in the Bible. And it really captures the depth, the breadth, and the length of every experience that a human will have between the crib and the grave. Whether you're having a moment that is worshipful or a moment that is mournful, whether you're having a moment that's exhausting or a moment that's filled with ecstasy, you can go to a psalm and find a psalm that captures how you feel in that moment. If you're having a good day, a psalm can capture that. If you're having a challenging day, a psalm can capture that. If you're in the middle of praise and worship, you can quote a psalm and it fits that moment. And if you're at a funeral, you can quote a psalm that will be comforting in that moment. And I recommend highly for those of you who want to go deeper in your study of the book of Psalms, I recommend this book entitled The Spirituality of the Psalms. 
It was written by a Old Testament scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann. And Brueggemann suggests that really you can break down the Psalms into three categories. You have Psalms of orientation. You have Psalms of disorientation. And then you have Psalms of reorientation. And he said, and those categories actually capture the seasons of all of our lives. Because sometimes you will be in a season of orientation. Sometimes you'll be in a season of disorientation. And sometimes you'll be in a season of reorientation. He said the Psalms of orientation basically express that God is God all by God's self. Everything is in order. God looks like God. God feels like God. There's some order in society. And, and, and this order that comes spiritually actually orders your world socially. Everything is perfect and pristine and polished. It's a good season when you're in a season of orientation. Everything makes sense. You like who you married. You get along with your family. You're happy to go to church and deal with church members. You are excited to go to work because life for you at that moment is a tiptoe through the tulips and a dazzling dance to the daisies and a rapid run through the roses. Life for you is a scoop of Jenny's ice cream with M&M's and Twizzlers and, and, and all types of sprinkles on top. And somebody right now, you're in a season where life is peaceful, pristine and polished, is sweet, is serene, is tranquil. God bless you if you're in those seasons now of orientation. He said, but you won't always stay in a season of orientation because there are other psalms that lift up disorientation and these are the psalms where God doesn't look like God where you're wondering Lord how long is this going to last it's, it's like Psalm 22 where he says why has thou forsaken me and I know I got some super duper deep spiritual people in the room and you eat Genesis for breakfast and Revelation for dinner and you've never had any, any theological wrestlings where God did not look like God to you but for those of us who've endured seasons of disorientation when you're in that season you know you believe but you're wondering God what you up to because your 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 resume is not matching my reality they said that you're a keeper but I feel like I'm falling apart they said that you're a healer but my mother my mother has cancer they said that you're a way maker but I feel stuck and trapped have you ever been in a season of disorientation and everybody around you at church seems to be in the move they feeling worship but you saying to yourself y'all ought to be glad I showed up today because I almost stayed at bedside Baptist with Pastor Pillow because sometimes you just ain't feeling this thing where are the hundred of y'all who can be honest and admit you saved but you still struggle you believe but you still have burdens you're a worshiper but you still worry you're a praise breaker but you still are under pressure sometimes and certain Psalms capture the disorientation when life is topsy-turvy in the ground beneath your feet is rocky and unsettled but then but then but then but then he says God doesn't leave you in seasons of disorientation you if you keep on saying good morning if you keep on believing that God answers prayers you will move over to what Brueggemann calls reorientation and I like this because when you come into reorientation now you just don't say God is good all the time now you say God is good all the time and all the time God is good because when God reorients you something has happened in the middle of your disorientation where you learn something about God that you didn't know why everything was perfect oh you don't learn about God when you got money in the bank shorty what you think no you learn about God when you're broke and you're wondering how you're gonna make it to Friday you learn about God when folk that you thought had your back put a knife in your back you learn about God when you run up against challenges and difficulties and turmoil and disenchantment and disillusionment can I holler at some real folk who can admit you did not learn about God on the mountain you learned about him in the valley and when you come out of this thing now your faith is stronger your worship is stronger your belief is stronger when you come to church you don't care what nobody do around you you just come out saying every Sunday this is the day matter of fact forget getting in the building I shout in the parking lot when God has shown me who he is and how much he can when I've been reoriented my faith is stronger my belief is stronger and what I like about Brueggemann he says and some Psalms have all three in one song 
You don't believe me. I can tell by the way you're looking at me. The way you're looking at me says you don't believe it. Psalm 23. Look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Doesn't that sound like orientation? He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Doesn't that sound like orientation? He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his orientation. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But here comes the disorientation. Verse 4. Yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I didn't want to go in the valley but I needed the valley because I'm going to learn something in the valley I didn't see on the mountain. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Here comes the reorientation for 13 of y'all that's going to shout Thou preparest a table before me. Not outside the presence of my enemies but while them jokers are looking right at me he anoints my head with oil. Surely I used to wonder, now I can say surely. I used to have questions, now I can say surely. My faith was depleted, but now I can say surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Somebody ought to thank God for your seasons of disorientation because they taught you how to trust God like you've never trusted him before. Go on and take a few seconds and thank God for your challenges. Thank God for your tears. The songwriter said, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know he could solve them. And that's what's going on in the text today with the author behind this text. It's David. And to appreciate Psalm 3, uh, to appreciate this content, you've got to understand the context. And to appreciate what David is wrestling with, the disorientation that David is dealing with in this text, you got to go back and read 2 Samuel chapter 15 through chapter 18 because here's what's happened. Let me drop it real low so you can pick it up light. Here's what happened. His son who he gave birth to is trying to take the kingdom and his son is trying to usurp the kingdom. David was anointed to be king of Israel. David was appointed to be king of Israel and now his son by the name of Absalom is getting people together, gathering the troops together to try to overtake the kingdom. The person he gave life to is trying to take his life. The person that he helped is trying to hurt him. The person that he lost sleep over to make sure they were safe. Now that person has turned again. You have not been hurt until you've been hurt by somebody you helped. Oh, there's no deeper pain in this world than for somebody that you were good to. When they were broke, you were there for them. When they were crying, you were there for them. And then they have amnesia and forget just how good you had been to them. And now they've turned on you. Have you ever been there before? And folks run around to my, my enemies, my haters. No, you better watch your family. You better watch your friends. You worried about the folk out there. You better worry about the folk up here because it's the people that know your business that can hurt you. And David is wrestling with this thing. And David, I, you know, I, I listen, I called him last night. I said, I got to preach in the morning, David. And I need you to tell me because it looked like you got a lot going on. I read verse 1. I read verse 2. I read verse 6. It felt like 10,000 of people have turned against you. You've said many. And, and I, yeah, and, and, and he didn't call me back, but he, but he was kind enough to send me a text message. And he said, Sharp, if you just read the text message, I'll show you how to survive when you got a lot going on. Anybody need this word today? Anybody balancing a lot right now? Number one, this is what David texts me. He said, you got to understand the reality of what's going on. Somebody say the reality, the reality, the reality of what's going on. It's right there in verse one. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Watch this word. Many are they that rise up against me. Verse two, many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him or her in God. Then you get to verse six. He said, I look around and folk that don't even like each other have gotten together just to hurt me. And it feels like 10,000 people have turned against me. That's what he says in verse 6. He uses the word many repetitiously because he wants us to understand just how overwhelming it is. Now, if you got two or three things going on in your life, you can handle that. If you got one trifling co-worker, you can handle that. If you got a little drama at the house, you can handle that. If you got one or two bills behind, you can handle that. If you got some folk that don't like it, you can deal with that. But what happens when that thing shifts? And it's not a few. It's not a couple. It's not one or two. It's many. Anybody ever had to deal with many? 
And I know the person sitting right beside you, they look so human right now. Eyebrows on fleek, lip gloss popping, shoes a shine, suit is pressed, hair's done, nails are dead. But underneath all that layers, somebody's sitting up in this sanctuary right now with many things on your mind, many expectations, many obligations, many aggravations, many irritations, many limitations, many trepidations, many vacillations, many hospitalizations, many miscommunications, many misrepresentations many temptations somebody shout many if it ain't one thing it's another many somebody said some somebody did some somebody tried some somebody assumed some somebody thought something somebody offended by something somebody plotting something somebody say many Sunday night is many calls about a family member. Monday is many news reports about our egomaniacal, narcissistic, megalomaniac commander in chief who can't even command his thumbs to stop tweeting stupidity into America's atmosphere every week. Many. Tuesday is many thoughts in your head. Do I quit or do I stay? Do I choke them or do I pray for them? Do I cuss them or do I be nice? Do I fire them now or do I let them go later? Do I clap back or do I be still and know they got Wednesday many bills Thursday many emails unresponded to many voicemails you haven't listened to many phone calls where you been I've been calling you child if you knew all I've been dealing with you would apologize for calling me Friday many cars on the road trying to find a bed or a bar Saturday many invitations and parties and programs and baby showers and weddings and funerals you got so much going on you just want to sit down somewhere Look at somebody and say, many, many, many. And then you come to church and try to act like it's all well. No, I'm glad that I got a God I ain't got to pretend with. The worst thing a preacher ever told a church is fake it till you make it. No, don't fake it till you make it. Faith it till you make it. You ought to walk in this house and say, God, let me holler at you for a minute. I got a lot going. It's me, oh Lord. Stand up. Can I holler at some real folk who can admit right now, Lord, I need you in my house, need you on my job, need you with my next pursuits, need you with my next vision, need you in my bank account. You ought to lift your hand and say, come holler at me, Lord. Come. You can sit there if you want to and act like everything is well. Don't you look at me when I start crying. Don't you look at me when I get on the altar. Don't you look at me when snot start coming down because I came to church because I need help with what I got going on. Somebody says, I'm just being real. Somebody says, I'm just being real. But oh, I love David because he don't just leave us hanging with the reality. Number two, he said, there's some reassurance. Because right there at the end of verse 2, if you just slow down and read, tiptoe through the text. Don't run, you're going to miss it. There's five little words at the end of verse 2. It's S-E-L-A-H. Selah. And, and, and you do know that the book of Psalms is the Jewish hymn book. And so when you read the Psalms, you're literally reading the lyrics of a song of the Jewish community. And it is believed by scholars that the word Selah literally meant rest. It means pause, stop, Think about it. And David started thinking, verse 1, all I got going on, all the people against me, they're talking about me, they're doing stuff to me, they're plotting against me. All this is going on. I got a lot in my head, a lot in my heart, dealing with a lot in my home. My own son is turned against me. But then he stops. Pause. Think about it. And he stopped looking around. And he started looking up. Yeah, because the problem with most of us is we talk too much. Amen, lights. Instagram talk too much, Facebook talk too much, Twitter talk too much, call on the phone talk too much. You, you, sometimes you need to get by yourself and have a moment with everything going on and just stop, pause, think about it because if you stop, pause and think about it, you'll stop thinking about who's against you and you'll remember who's still for you. Because by the time you get to verse 3, here comes your reassurance. And if you don't get happy, I'm going to have to check your faith. David says, but thou, O Lord are a shield for me my glory are your bibles open and the lifter of my head you oh god are a shield for me my glory and the lifter of my head you oh god are a shield for me my glory and the lifter of my you oh god 
I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I've had a Selah moment and now I'm looking to the hill. You, oh Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the lift of my head. Church folk don't know in the shout. I said, God is your shield. God is your glory. God knows how to lift your head. When he says he's your shield, that means he rescues you from harm. When it says he's your glory, that means he restores your honor. When it says he lifts your head, it means he recalibrates your head. Can I back into the verse? If I just back into this verse, he said he's the lifter of my head. You, you don't appreciate this unless you go back to 2 Samuel 15 because David was so overwhelmed in 2 Samuel chapter 15 that there's a moment in that text where he's literally walking up a hill with a cloak over his head his head is down and the Bible says he's weeping when he thought about what his son had done when he thought about what old friends how they had turned on him he's walking up the hill with a cloak over his head and all he can do is weep his head is down and I don't care how saved you are you're going to have some moments where your head drops down when you lose a loved one that makes your head drop when you get an unexpected phone call about some negative news that makes your head drop when you look at the news and listen to anything your president says it makes your head drop when you go to church and think you're going to run into loving, forgiving, and compassionate people and some of the meanest, messiest folk you ever meet in your life go to church, not fellowship, I'm talking about the church down the street. It'll make your head drop. But the text does not say God's going to help you lift your head. The text says God will lift your head. And when you don't have the strength to look up again, he'll lift it up for you. And that's what's happening right now in the sanctuary. You walked in here heavy, but you're going to leave out light because God is lifting your head. And where you're going to look, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. Not some, but all. All my help. He recalibrates my head. But let's keep on backing into that verse because he said he's my glory. And when you look at that, that does not mean that he's going to give you his glory. But the word there is he's going to restore your honor. Because some seasons, it's so much going on, you don't even feel like you anymore. You look in the mirror and don't even recognize that person. You used to laugh. You used to smile. You used to be nice to people. Now you walk in church looking like you're smelling chitlins every Sunday. You're just mean. You don't have patience. You're snappy. You got an attitude with folk that never done anything to you. You lost yourself. You went through that valley and now you don't feel like you anymore. You used to wear heels. Now you're just in flats. You used to give attention to your toenails and your fingernails. Now, now your feet look like build bear because you don't feel like yourself. You used to go get a haircut now you need a line up you need some chapstick because you just don't feel like yourself you feel dry and depleted and tired can't get out the bed God says that when I get through with you I'm going to restore your honor I'm going to give you your swag back I'm going to give you your smile back I'm going to give you your energy back I will restore not just time but years that the canker worm I'm preaching better than y'all acting that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the cat Caterpillar have to anybody glad God can restore. Go on and high five somebody. Say, I'm getting it back. Yeah, the devil took some of my energy. The devil took some of my dreams. The devil took some of my joy. But before I leave fellowship, I'm gonna get some of my stuff back. I'm gonna feel like myself again. He'll restore your honor. Oh, but the text doesn't finish there. It says God is your shield. Yeah. Dr. Miles Jones, the former professor at the Virginia Union of Preaching and Homiletics, he told his class, people shout over trash and get silent on truth. Yeah. 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 Thou, O oh Lord, yeah. are a shield. Yeah. Yeah. Thou, O oh Lord, Oh, shield. Yeah. You're going to get it in a minute. Thou, oh Lord. Oh, shield. Yeah. I think y'all getting it now. Thou, oh Lord. 
or sometimes you got to shout over the scripture. You don't need no hype. Just thank God for his word. God just don't give you a shield. God is your shield. And whatever anybody is trying to throw at you, they got to come through God before it hits you. Oh, this, this text means something different to me now. Because life will reveal stuff about what God's word is really talking about. I told Refuel, I told 8 o'clock service about two weeks ago, my aunt was in Atlanta, minding her business, driving to eat breakfast. And she drove through a gang-infested area. And they were over there fighting. And they pulled out guns on each other. Neither one of them got shot, but the stray bullet came in my aunt's car, hit her in the neck, and she had just enough strength to get to a gas station, get in the ambulance, and they took her, and they immediately took her into automatic emergency surgery because they didn't know the damage that had been done. The neck is one of the most sensitive areas. So I get a call in Chicago about what's going on in Atlanta. Anxiety, angst, trepidation, fear grips my body, and I get down on my knees with tears coming down my face. I said, God, you've handled harder things than this. I, I, I'm gonna preach for me now. I said, God, I've heard about you and you've handled harder things than this. Save my auntie. About two hours later, my mama calls and auntie's doing fine. If the bullet had moved over a couple millimeters, she would have hit a major artery, but it fell in a muscle. They got the bullet out and now she's healing. I told you church folk don't know in the shop because she should have been dead. But right now, she's alive. Oh, but that ain't the shout. They found her car a couple days later because the investigators wanted to know what happened with the bullet. How did it enter the car? And this is what they discovered. The bullet went through the windshield, hit the dashboard, bounced up, and hit her neck. Therefore, she was not really hit or shot. She was grazed. But if the bullet had gone through the window, my aunt, we would have been having her funeral. But because it hit the windshield first, it took some impact off. God said, I'm your shield. And whatever the enemy tries to throw at you, it may hit you, but it won't kill you. It may hit you, but it won't destroy you. It may hit you, but now I want to hear who's able to keep you. Somebody ought to shake your neighbor's hand like you're going to shake it off and say, neighbor, I got a lot going on, but I feel better, so much better now that I know God is my shield, God is my glory, God lifts my head. Is there anybody here on a Sunday morning that can help this little country preacher Give God praise this morning that with all you got going on, you still got your joy. With all you got going on, you still got a smile. With all all you got going on, you still got a thank you, Jesus, and a hallelujah. And this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You still got a I will bless the Lord. At all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Anybody in the house know God will keep you. Anybody in the house, no God will hold you. Anybody in the house, no God will make a way out of no way. Say yes, say yes. Look down your road and tell everybody you're shielded. 
your future shielded your dreams are shielded your children are shielded your church is shielded your head is shielded your anointing is shielded your Can y'all do me one more favor? And I'm done with my little sermon. Put your arm around your neighbor. Put your arm around your neighbor. Shake them and rock them. Rock them and shake them. Say, neighbor, I don't mean to get on your nerves, but I just got to tell you, I've got a whole lot going on right now. But tell them, neighbor, hold on. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy, joy, joy is going to come in the morning. Hold on. It was good that I was afflicted because now I know your word. Hold on. They that wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength they are mounted up on wings as eagles run not get weary walk and not faint can I tell you one more thing be not dismayed whatever betides you God will You better go to work tomorrow and walk in the office. Go out to eat after church and walk in the restaurant. Go home in your bedroom. Shielded. Anybody been kept? Anybody been kept? Say yes. Say, I'm about to show you what it looks like when God keeps you. Tell them, scoot over a little bit. I got to praise and I got to get it out. If you don't want to praise him, please get out my way. But when I think ah, of the goodness of Jesus and I... somebody neighbor you want to shout cuz I've been kept and I'm a shout cuz you've been kept one two one two three pray them that this message was a blessing to you I've got a lot going on and many of us we got a lot going on we got lots going on in our life we got a lot going on with our family but isn't it good to know isn't it good to know that God has left us someone who can help us when we're trying to get through the times when we have a lot going on 
that is the person of Jesus Christ and we want to offer Christ to you uh, information is coming up on the screen where you can either email us or text us if you would like to give your life to Christ uh, perhaps you want to join a church family that will help you when a lot is going on in your life we would love to have you as a member of fellowship uh, information again is on the screen feel free to text us or email us we would love to be a part of your family family I also want to give you another opportunity to give if you have not done so already continue to sow in even while the pastor is away we are so so grateful to have a church that supports the vision of Fellowship Chicago. All we're doing right here from 45th Place in Princeton. Well, family, I want to get out your way. I want to get you back to your family so you can enjoy your family, enjoy your meal tonight. Whatever you're eating, make sure it's good. And uh, I pray uh, you have a great, great week. Let's, let me give you the benediction. Uh, may your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. And may your bad days prove that God is good. I pray that your entire life proves that God is good. Have a great, great week, family. Peace, peace. Fellowship, get ready to set sail as we celebrate our 72nd church anniversary cruising with the ship. Cruising, cruising with the ship. From the Odyssey, Lake Michigan. It's an all-white affair on Saturday, September 10th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Boarding begins at 12.15 p.m. There will be a boatload of food, fun, and fellowship. And fellowship. Tickets are on sale for $72 per person. Get your ticket now at fellowshipchicago.com. Fellowshipchicago.com. Must be 21 and older to attend. Fellowship Chicago presents Summertime Shy Worship Five. Summertime Shy Worship Five. This is a power packed, don't miss event featuring Elder Mark Moore. If you got the power of God on the inside, you got prophetic power in your mind. Look at somebody and say, it's not only going to be bigger, but it's also going to be better. Summertime Shy Worship Five. Summertime Shy Worship Five. Make plans and tell your friends and family every Sunday in August at Fellowship Chicago. Fellowship Chicago. Thank you for worshiping with Fellowship Chicago on the virtual ship. We've always had a commitment of service, and during this season, we've increased our efforts to serve you better. We have made it easy for you to stay connected to get the complete resources you need. You can email us at info at fellowshipchicago.com. Call the church office Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at 773-924-3232 and our social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. For real-time updates, you can text Fellowship Chicago to 55949. We have exciting and informative resources throughout the entire week designed specifically with you in mind. Go to fellowshipchicago.com for the full schedule. Until we dock again, thank you for your prayers and financial support of Fellowship Chicago. Remember, we are in this together. Shut your spirit. Kept his word. That's all you heard. Now unto him who's able to do it.